Hey, what's up, friends? Grant Bolden here. Welcome back to the Speaker Lab Speech Breakdowns, where today we're going to be taking a TED Talk from Michael Jr., who is a very good comedian and who has a, a phenomenal message here. Now, oftentimes we think comedians are just there to make you laugh, and he certainly does that. But he also does a great job opening loops, making a powerful point, uh, using quick little stories and anecdotes. So he has a lot to give us here, a lot for us to learn. So let's get right into this speech breakdown. <laughs> I'm excited about being here. We're gonna have some fun. My name is Michael Jr. I'm gonna do some jokes. Now, uh, I'm assuming, we didn't get to see the intro, but the intro is really, really important. The bio for this person is very, very important because it sets the tone for the first couple lines that he's going to say. Now, he said, I'm going to do some jokes. I'm assuming in the introduction, it made it very, very clear he's a comedian. So, just the fact that he is a comedian, that that's probably been stated already to the audience, the audience has an expectation to do what? They have an expectation to laugh, to respond to what it, what it is that he's going to say. So, if they just, if the introduction was basically, our next speaker is Michael Jr., he's a very good speaker, you're going to enjoy him. And I said nothing about humor, nothing about comedy, nothing about being funny, nothing about that. And he came out and he said this, that first line of, I'm gonna tell you some jokes. It would be funny, but it probably is not as funny as with having the introduction that says he's a comedian, and then he comes out and delivers that line. The audience is already expecting to laugh. They're expecting humor, so that first line gets the reaction because of probably what we didn't see in the introduction there. That makes sense? All right, let's keep going. Yet, at the same time, I'd like to explain to you how life, well, how comedy works. So, uh, let's jump right in. I actually like the city of Reno a lot. Um, I was here once. I was here once. Uh, now, I'm assuming that he's speaking in Reno. This is the TED Talk in Nevada, or a TEDx uh, presentation in Nevada. So, I'm assuming that's where he is, because if he's speaking in Orlando and says, I, you know, I really like Reno, uh, Nevada, let me tell you why, it's probably not going to resonate, not going to make a lot of sense. So, anytime you can do something that, again, is specific to that audience, specific to that geographical location, that's specific to them, it's always going to get a solid reaction, uh, assuming that you, you've done your homework there, right? Because they, the audience knows, like, this isn't something that he could do anywhere. This is specifically for us, for our audience, for right now in this moment. I was keynote speaking for a corporation and uh, something really kind of strange happened when I was there. So uh, normally I'm the type of person, I like to be on stage alone. I don't need any help, anybody. So the CEO of this large company introduces me and he has the microphone and normally we have two different mics and he leaves and then I'm there, that's the plan. Dude stays there. I'm standing right next to One of the things that he could do there is, let's go back just a second here. Okay, so what he could do here is he could say, um, normally we have two microphones, he introduces me, he leaves, I stay there. He could, now the audience already can fill in the blank of what's gonna happen. Well, I'm assuming, like he said, he, the, the guy sticks around, he stays there. So the audience can already get ahead of him in the joke. So one thing he could do there is, is drag that pause out a little bit longer because it creates a funny moment because again, the audience starts to laugh and they, they did laugh there if you listen, but before he says dude stays there, they're already starting to laugh. So the longer he pauses, the more that creates some humor. It's the plan. Do stays there. So they started the lap and he went right into that next line, right? So if he, if he held on to that a little bit longer, could have got a, a bit more of a reaction there. There. I'm standing right next to him with no mic. And then he looks at the audience and I'm standing there and he says, first let me, let me explain this. Um, I'm the type of comedian, like I'm, very, I'm observational. Um, like I pay attention to things like college students. Take somebody who goes to a nice school, like the University of Southern California. Ask them what school they go to, you get a- Okay, I like this because now what, what are we doing? We are hanging on wondering where this story is gonna go. Hang on, hang on, get back to the story. Get back to the dude who, who's sitting there next to you. What happened, right? Now he's gonna take a little bit of a tangent here. He knows what, exactly what he's doing. He's gonna come back to that, but it keeps the audience. He's opened the loop, and now we wanna know where does that story go. And so we're hanging on. We wanna know where he's gonna go with this. Uh, and so it keeps the audience engaged. Nice, quick answer. What school you go to? USC? New York University, you get a nice, quick answer. What school you go to? NYU? Ask somebody to go to community college. You get a much longer response, don't you? What school you go to? 
Well, see, right now, what I'm doing, uh, I'm going to get a couple credits, right? Then my financial aid is supposed to come through. Then I'm going to transfer, man. They say school kills creativity anyway, man. I feel vulnerable. Is Brene Brown around, man? I feel really vulnerable right now. Let me tell you a little more about me. I, have a, I love being a dad. And I have five this, kids. Right? Yeah, and, uh, and I travel a lot, you know, so I can see them all. Um, <laughs> I'm just playing. I don't see him. I don't see him. Uh, That's good. No, I do. I have five kids. They're all with me. I live in Dallas now. Um, my kids are awesome. Uh, the thing about having a big family is you always have to figure out ways to save money. Um, and we wanted to get our family pictures taken, and that stuff was expensive. So we did to save money, right? So we all got in the front seat of the car. Look both ways and ran a red light. That's what we did. That's what we did. Um, two weeks later, the picture came in the mail. <laughs> but my son blinked, so we had to do it again. We had to do it again. So, it's crazy. so what he's doing there is those are called tags, where he, the, you know, we we ran a red light, um, and that that's the joke, right? And then the tag is. Um, uh, two weeks later, it came in the mail, right? The tag, and then the tag to that is uh, sun blinks, so we had to do it again. Uh, so he can just kind of like, you take one joke and you kind of flesh it out. Now, obviously, there's a point there where he keeps going. If you go too much, it's just, it's not funny anymore, and it loses the effectiveness and the power. Um, and so he's not going to do that. He's extremely good at what, he, what it is that he does here. But again, something to be aware of that you don't want to go too long to the point where it's no longer funny. But look for some of those simple little tags that you can add on to the end of a joke. I was doing that joke in prison recently. Um, I wasn't in prison like, hey, I'm funny, get off me. It wasn't like that. <laughs> we go to home, whenever we're doing a big live event, like we're doing one tonight in uh, Reno, whenever we do a large ticketed event, a concert in a city, we always look for a homeless shelter or a prison abuse children's facility to go to during the day, do comedy. So I'm doing a prison this time, and um, yeah, it's a TED talk. I don't got that much time. You don't got clap. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So we're doing this prison, and I do the joke about the red light, and 75% of the prisoners laugh, the rest of them, nothing. <laughs> then I realized what was going on. Some of them had been locked up for so long, the dude next to him had to explain the joke. Wow. He was like, see, nowadays when you run a red light, they send a picture with a ticket in the mail. Then he looked at the dude next to him and was like, a red light is what they use for traffic when you go down the road. <laughs> And then he said, a road is what they use. So again, tag, 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 right? Uh, just b helps the joke to build upon itself. Where am I at right now? Man? So I'd like to explain to you how comedy works. This is how comedy works. Uh, I mean, really all comedy. Anytime you laugh, this, this formula is taking place in one way or another. But specifically with regards to stand-up, this is how it works as well. Um, first, there's a setup. And then there's a punchline. Let me explain. The setup is when a comedian will use his talents and resources to seize any opportunity to ensure that you, the audience, are moving in the same direction. The punchline occurs when he changes that direction in a way you're not expecting. When you catch on to this change, you've received the punchline. The results are revelation, fulfillment, and joy expressed through laughter. <laughs> Let me give you an example. A few summers ago, I took my uh, family on vacation to Mexico. Um, the first two days were rough because the people there kept calling me a Negro. Uh, the third day, I realized they were saying amigo, and it was all cool. That was cool, so. Did you see what just happened right there? <laughs> so when I was a child, um, I used to struggle with my reading. I used to really have a hard time reading. Um, it just... I don't know what it was. I just, I just struggle with it. I read now just fine. Like the signs over the door to say excite. I can read that stuff. <laughs> but when I was a kid, I used to struggle uh, with my reading. Like I couldn't sound a word out phonetically. It just didn't work. Uh, so now looking back at it, I realize I developed like seven different ways to look at a word to determine what the word was. And I'm talking about just started noticing this really in junior high. So I would look at the, the font size, the color, the positioning, what's in front of it, what's behind it, how people responded to it. I got really good at looking at words differently. To the point in high school, people didn't know I wasn't really reading. I was just working it out really, really fast. 
Now as an adult, I read just fine, but I still have this ability to look at words and people and situations seven different ways almost immediately. In fact, it's the primary place where I pull my comedy from. So that very thing from my past, it looked like it was a setback, looked like it was some sort of handicap, Turns out, uh, I'm actually able to use it for what I'm called to do now. So just like you, you've probably had some sort of setbacks, but if you would, in a way, embrace it, you'll probably find there's more opportunities out there. Now I find comedy all over the place. To, at the airport today, little white kid walk Knows what happened. He still hasn't got back to the beginning of the story, right? Which is fine, right? Because we're all still hanging on there. We're wondering where this is going to go. So when he eventually gets there, my guess is at this point, we are... Let's see here, uh, we're about a third of the way into the talk. He's probably gonna wait till the very end to do it at this point, would be my guess, so we'll see what happens. To me, actual autograph. I was like, hey buddy, what's your name? He said, I'm Tanner. I looked at him, I said, no you're not. <laughs> His mom was cracking up. He was like, I am Tanner. It's like, trust me, <laughs> you're not. Or I'll notice stuff, like I saw this dude with a muscle shirt. Don't you ever see a dude with like a muscle shirt, like a white tank, like a, but he ain't got no muscles? I'm like, what is that, a wife threatener? <laughs> Depending on where you're from in the country, you understand that joke better. I noticed one thing he does really well is pausing, right? So after he delivers the punchline, then he pauses and gives the audience a chance to respond to it, right? So instead of laughter and I'm just gonna keep cruising right on, the audience is still enjoying that moment. So allow that moment to hang there before you proceed on. And his friend had on a shirt that said, if you don't speak English, leave the country. Um, but it was written in English, so. <laughs> So I walked up to him and I said, you're dumb. <laughs> but I said it in Spanish, though, so he didn't know. He didn't know. <laughs> so I'm able to find comedy in a bunch of different places as a result of embracing what seemed like it was a handicap from my past. I noticed even what- Now again, this is kind of this transition line to here's the, here's the big point, the overarching idea that he's trying to make here. Uh, and now he's gonna, uh, I'm gonna make some joke, 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 and now I'm gonna come back to that point again. And it just kind of reframes it and it almost kind of makes a transition to, okay, what I'm gonna talk about now, just for a quick second, may be a bit more serious. It may be making, kind of drilling into this point. Then I'm gonna come back to using humor again. What people say sometimes, have you ever heard the phrase, boy, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall. Every time I hear that, I walk up to the person and I say, and then what? <laughs> no, 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 you wanna be a fly on the wall so you can hear the information that was in the room. Well, I've done the research. Um, flies don't have ears. Yeah, you would be just as ignorant as you currently are, <laughs> but you would be a fly. Nobody even listens to a fly. I mean, let's say you're a fly that could read lips. What are you gonna do with the information? <laughs> and you got two days to live. <laughs> You're making bad choices. Again, tag, 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 tag. And then notice again, it's a pause and a break between each one of those lines, right? So he could take each line and just cram it all together and just bam, 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 just kind of machine gun his way through it, but just line, pause, line, pause, line, pause, line, pause. And so it gives, again, the audience the chance to react to each one of those. Or people will sometimes say stuff to me like, Michael Jr., where are you from originally? I'm like, originally? Huh, well, uh, I was conceived in Michigan. Yeah, before that, I was with my dad. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then there's a swim competition, right? Uh -huh. And I won, which is crazy. Because currently, I don't swim at all. I used to be pretty good, though, apparently. I am not politically correct. I'm just gonna tell, I know I do comedy, but I'm not, it's just too much work. I'm just telling you, um, you gotta watch the news and know the language. I just believe if you put the right stuff in your heart, the right stuff will come out. So I never try to, I never try to be politically correct. Some people work hard. I'm at a coffee shop. There's a white guy in front of me, orders a coffee. The lady in front of him is like, hey, how do you want it? He looked back at me and was like, um, African American, please. <laughs> I was like, cool, uh, let me get the Caucasian mocha. Let me get that if I could. Let's get the Caucasian mocha, I guess. I'm try trying to learn, I'm trying to learn. <laughs> a 
coaches would say some stuff too. You ever hear your coach say something like, the stuff I'm teaching you here, it's not just about this game. You can apply it to life. Here's the thing, people, that's not true. <laughs> I thought it was true. Straight out of high school, one of my first jobs was, was, I, was I used to park cars. One of the cars was really nice, so I took it for a little spin. The company found out and my boss lost the account. He was yelling at me and screaming. I didn't know what to say or do. I thought back to my high school football coach. I looked at my boss, I was like, you know what, man? You win some, you lose some, man. <laughs> you can't let this one loss get you down. <laughs> the important thing is, I went out there and I had fun. <laughs> and I got fired, man, I got fired right now. <laughs> Actually, play, uh, I do play some basketball. I didn't want to perpetuate stereotypes, but it's true. Um, <laughs> But in basketball, you're supposed to run and jump. I don't really feel like doing both all the time. Um, so some friends recently took me ball hunting. Um, some people call it golf or whatever. Uh, <laughs> I shot a 121. That was what I shot, a 121. And then we had lunch, and it was like, hey, we're going to do the other nine holes now. Um, <laughs> I was like, I'm not going back out there. I'm not going. Cause they lied to get me to go. They was like, yo, the greens are awesome. I was like, cool. I showed up with some cornbread. I was like, all right. I don't know how to say cornbread in German. I'm sorry. I just did that just for Germany. I've never really been there before. I do think working out is important. I was at the gym the other month. And, um, I was gonna do some cardio, right? But they moved it upstairs. I ain't going up there, man, please. <laughs> And I get recognized at the gym. I got recognized. This, um, I'm working out. This lady's like, <gasps> I was like, hey, how you doing? She's like, you don't understand, Michael Jr. You're my favorite comedian. Every time I see you, I laugh my butt off. I was like, uh, keep laughing, you know. <laughs> keep laughing. That was good. <laughs> so there's a club in Los Angeles. When I moved to Los Angeles and I was brand new in comedy, there's a club there that, uh, uh, it's, it's like the best club in the country. It's called the Comedy and Magic Club. It's actually in Hermosa Beach. This club is extremely hard for a comedian to get into. The way I got into this club is a guy named George Wallace saw me when I lived in New York. He knew I was funny and clean. So when I moved to Los Angeles, he took me to the Comedy and Magic Club. Now he couldn't get me on stage because it's way too prestigious of a club. They have to know who you are. So, so he got me into the green room. I'm in the green room and suddenly brand new in town and I find myself in the green room with some soldiers in comedy. There's um, George Wallace, Gary Shanley, Jay Leno. I'm brand new in town. And at the time, a football player got hit in the eye uh, with a flag and um, he lost his vision in one eye and he was suing the league for $400 million. Now all of these guys are helping Leno on that joke subject for the monologue for the Tonight Show on NBC. I ain't saying nothing. I'm just happy to be in the room sharing french fries with these dudes but your gift will make room for you. So then they got quiet and they all looked at me and I'm thinking, oh snap, this is an opportunity. So I was like, all right, let me see if I got this right. He got hit in the eye with a flag, he lost his vision in one eye and he's suing the league for $400 million. Oh, he not gonna see half of it. That's good. Like for real. So here's the thing, how did I get that joke that fast under that much pressure? The truth is it wasn't as much pressure as you might think because I had been practicing since I was a child in the form of a kid who was having a hard time reading. I was practicing just like you've probably been practicing. You just didn't know you were practicing. I'm here to let you know you've been practicing. And for a lot of you guys, it's game time. It's game time. So now I'm in the club, like I'm in the club and I'm performing there. Um, this is now, good job of just like telling a story Pausing in the midst of the story, kind of just, all right, I'm going to step out of that, and I'm going to make a point here, and I'm going to come back to the story. Probably like seven, eight years ago, and right, I'm headlining at the club, and right before I get on stage, I had a change in mindset about comedy. Most of the time when a comedian gets on stage, he wants to get laughs from people. And I felt a shift take place. Instead of going up there to get laughs from people, I felt like I was supposed to give them an opportunity to laugh. I did a little prayer, and I clearly felt like I was supposed to give an opportunity to laugh. This 
change everything. Because now I'm not looking to take, I'm simply looking for an opportunity to give. This is why we now go to the homeless shelters and all these places. In fact, that very night when I leave the stage, I'm outside, people want autographs, we're hanging out, taking pictures. And I look across the street and I saw a homeless guy. I had never seen a homeless guy outside this club before, ever. But that doesn't mean he wasn't there before. That just means before, my mindset was to get last from people, so why would I even notice him? But now I changed my mindset and I see this homeless guy and I have the thought, what about him? How could I give him an opportunity to laugh? And that's when we started doing homeless shelters and prisons and take, making laughter commonplace and other common, non-common places. So now as a result of doing that, um, we went to this one place, we went to Montrose, Colorado. Um, it's an abuse, it's a facility for children who are being abused by their parents. And I'm hearing all of these stories and his grandmother tells us about her grandson who was so afraid of his mom because he's on drugs. She's been abusing him and one of the things she's been doing is she's been pulling out his toenails. So I hear this story and all, they bring all these kids inside and Spider-Man is sitting right up, this little boy is so afraid of his mom, everywhere he goes he wears a Spider-Man costume. He's sitting right up front at the show. If my mindset was still to get last from people, there's no way I would have been able to do the show. But my mindset changed and, I, and so now I, I have to do the show. So I get up on stage and people start laughing slowly but surely. 20 minutes in it, I hear a voice come from right here and the voice says, my name is Ronan. And this little boy pulls off his mask and introduces himself to me. In a way, and I can't even tell you what it meant to me. And he started talking to me for like nine minutes like I wasn't doing a comedy show at the time. <laughs> but it was all because I made this shift. I made, I, I made this change and I said simply, instead of trying to get, I'm going to see if there's an opportunity to give. If you can make this adjustment, it will change your life for the good. If you're a mechanic, you may think you get paid to fix vehicles, but if you can make this shift, you will recognize you help people reach their desired destination. That will put your alarm clock out of business. My senses are there's a lot of people out there still hitting the snooze button. Before I bounce, bounce means they vacate the premises. <laughs> I'd like to explain to you how life works, at least from a comedian's perspective. First there's a setup, and then there's a punchline. Your setup is your talents, your resources, and your opportunities. And most of the time, we use our setup to ensure that the people around us are moving in a direction that serves us which means the punchline occurs when you change that direction in a way they're not expecting. You actually use your setup for other people. The results are the same yet multiply. Revelation, fulfillment, and joy, but it's not just for the one receiving your punchline. It is absolutely for you as you deliver the punchline. In fact, if I ask the question to everyone here, everyone watching, if I ask you this question, um, how many people here know what your setup is? Every one of you would be able to tell me. Because your setup is the fact that you have a house, a car, you've been married, you went to school. Your setup is about what you've received. But what if I ask the question, what is your punchline? Because your punchline is about what you're called to deliver. And if you only know your setup and not your punchline, you'll make the mistake of trying to add more setup. If I could just get another degree, if I could just get married, if I could just lose weight. But what you really need is to know your punchline. Again, because to know your setup and not your punchline is an uncomfortable place to live. Let me give you an example. How many people are still thinking about the story of me and the CEO on stage? <laughs> Good. The reason all you guys are still thinking about that story is because all you have is the setup. You don't have the punchline. Yet we've moved on and allowed ourselves to be entertained like, like there wasn't something missing. So we'll go to a comedy show or a football game or a concert, even though there's something missing. And that's just the story I told you 10 minutes ago. What about your story? That's good. You've been living it your entire life, and if all you know is the setup and not the punchline, you are living in an uncomfortable place. And please be clear, just like when I had a hard time reading as a child, your setbacks are part of your setup, so you can deliver the punchline you're called to deliver. Much like a slingshot, the further you've been set back, the further you're going to reach. But what are you gonna aim for? Everyone has a setup. 
and everyone has a punchline. You need to find your punchline and deliver it. I'm Michael Jr. I love you. Thank you guys. Oh, you guys are awesome. Stand an ovation. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Here again. Get up, dude. You too. I'm just going. Thank you. Thank you. I want to see if he's going to deliver that last line. All right, maybe not. So maybe that was, a, again, intentional to make sure that the audience understood the main point and the main message there. So really, really good stuff there from Michael Jr. All right, there you go, my friends. Hope you enjoyed that speech breakdown with Michael Jr. Hey, if you enjoyed that, don't forget to like this video. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of these videos. And then finally, don't forget to comment below. Let us know what is one takeaway that you learned from this talk that you're going to be applying to your next speech or presentation. All right, my friends, we'll catch you next time. You're awesome.